Chapter thirty seven of Far from the Madding Crowd. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Tige Hines. Far from the Madding Crowd by Thomas Hardy. Chapter thirty seven. The Storm. The Two Together. A light flapped over the scene, as if reflected from phosphorescent wings crossing the sky, and a rumble filled the air. It was the first move of the approaching storm. The second peal was noisy, with comparatively little visible lightning. Gabriel saw a candle shining in Bathsheba's bedroom, and soon a shadow swept to and fro upon the blind. Then there came a third flash. Manoeuvres of a most extraordinary kind were going on in the vast firmamental hollows overhead. The lightning now was the colour of silver, and gleamed in the heavens like a mailed army. Rumbles became rattles. Gabriel, from his elevated position, could see over the landscape at least half a dozen miles in front. Every hedge, bush, and tree was distinct, as in a line engraving. In a paddock in the same direction was a herd of heifers, and the forms of these were visible at this moment in the act of galloping about, in the wildest and maddest confusion, flinging their heels and tails high into the air, their heads to the earth. A poplar in the immediate foreground was like an ink-stroke on burnished tin. Then the picture vanished, leaving the darkness so intense that Gabriel worked entirely by feeling with his hands. He had stuck his sticking-rod, or poniard, as it was indifferently called, a long iron lance polished by handling, into the stack, used to support the sheaves instead of the support called a groom used in houses. A blue light appeared in the zenith, and in some indescribable manner flickered down near the top of the rod. It was the fourth of the larger flashes. A moment later there was a smack, smart, clear, and short. Gabriel felt his position to be anything but a safe one, and he resolved to descend. Not a drop of rain had fallen as yet. He wiped his weary brow, and looked again at the black forms of the unprotected stacks. Was his life so valuable to him after all? What were his prospects that he should be so chary of running risk, when important and urgent labour could not be carried on without such risk? He resolved to stick to the stack. However, he took a precaution. Under the staddles was a long tethering chain, used to prevent the escape of errant horses. This he carried up the ladder, and sticking his rod through the clog at one end, allowed the other end of the chain to trail upon the ground. The spike attached to it he drove in. Under the shadow of this extemporised lightning conductor he felt himself comparatively safe. Before Oak had laid his hands upon his tools again, out leapt the fifth flash, with the spring of a serpent and the shout of a fiend. It was as green as an emerald, and the reverberation was stunning. What was this the light revealed to him? In the open ground before him, as he looked over the ridge of the rick, was a dark and apparently female form. Could it be that of the only venturesome woman in the parish, Bathsheba? The form moved on a step. Then he could see no more. "'Is that you, ma'am?' said Gabriel to the darkness. "'Who is there?' said the voice of Bathsheba. "'Gabriel, I am on the rick thatching.' "'Oh, Gabriel, and are you? I have come about them. The weather awoke me, and I thought of the corn. I am so distressed about it. Can we save it anyhow? I cannot find my husband. Is he with you?' "'He is not here.' Do you know where he is? Asleep in the barn. He promised that the stack should be seen to, and now they are all neglected. Can I do anything to help? Liddy is afraid to come out. Fancy finding you here at such an hour. Surely I can do something. You can bring up some reed sheaves to me, one by one, ma'am, if you are not afraid to come up the ladder in the dark, said Gabriel. Every moment is precious now, and that would save a good deal of time. It's not very dark when the lightning has been gone a bit. I'll do anything, she said resolutely. She instantly took a sheaf upon her shoulder, clambered up close to his heels, placed it behind the rod, and descended for another. At her third ascent the rick suddenly brightened with the brazen glare of shining majolica. 
Every knot in every straw was visible. On the slope in front of him appeared two human shapes, black as jet. The rick lost its sheen, the shapes vanished. Gabriel turned his head. It had been the sixth flash which had come from the east behind him, and the two dark forms on the slope had been the shadows of himself and Bathsheba. Then came the peal. It was hardly credible that such a heavenly light could be the parent of such a diabolical sound. "'How terrible!' she exclaimed, and clutched him by the sleeve. Gabriel turned, and steadied her on her aerial perch by holding her arm. At the same moment, while he was still reversed in his attitude, there was more light, and he saw, as it were, a copy of the tall poplar tree on the hill, drawn in black on the wall of the barn. It was the shadow of that tree, thrown across by a secondary flash in the west. The next flare came. Bathsheba was on the ground now, shouldering another sheaf, and she bore its dazzle without flinching, thunder and all, and again ascended with a load. There was then a silence everywhere for four or five minutes, and the crunch of the spars, as Gabriel hastily drove them in, could again be distinctly heard. He thought the crisis of the storm had passed, but there came a burst of light. "'Hold on,' said Gabriel, taking the sheaf from her shoulder and grasping her arm again. Heaven opened then, indeed. The flash was almost too novel for its inexpressibly dangerous nature to be at once realised, and they could only comprehend the magnificence of its beauty. It sprang from the east, west, north, and south, and was a perfect dance of death. The forms of skeletons appeared in the air, shaped with blue fire for bones, dancing, leaping, striding, racing round, and mingling together in unparalleled confusion. With these were intertwined undulating snakes of green, and behind these was a broad mass of lesser light. Simultaneously came from every part of the tumbling sky what may be called a shout, since, though no shout ever came near it, it was more of the nature of a shout than of anything else earthly. In the meantime one of the grisly forms had alighted upon the point of Gabriel's rod to run invisibly down it, down the chain and into the earth. Gabriel was almost blinded, and he could feel Bathsheba's warm arm tremble in his hand, a sensation novel and thrilling enough, but love, life, everything human seemed small and trifling in such close juxtaposition with an infuriated universe. Oak had hardly time to gather up these impressions into a thought, and to see how strangely the red feather of her hat shone in this light when the tall tree on the hill before mentioned seemed on fire to a white heat, and a new one among these terrible voices mingled with the last crash of those proceeding. It was a stupefying blast, harsh and pitiless, and it fell upon their ears in a dead, flat blow, without that reverberation which lends the tones of a drum to more distant thunder. By the lustre reflected from every part of the earth, and from the wide domical scoop above it, he saw that a tree was sliced down the whole length of its tall, straight stem, a huge ribbon of bark being apparently flung off. The other portion remained erect, and revealed the bared surface as a strip of white down the front. The lightning had struck the tree. A sulphurous smell filled the air, then all was silent, and black as a cave in Hinnom. "'We had a narrow escape,' said Gabriel hurriedly. "'You'd better go down.' Bathsheba said nothing, but he could distinctly hear her rhythmical pants and the recurrent rustle of the sheaf beside her in response to her frightened pulsations. She descended the ladder, and, on second thoughts, he followed her. The darkness was now impenetrable by the sharpest vision. They both stood at the bottom, side by side. Bathsheba appeared to think only of the weather. Oak thought only of her just then. At last he said, "'The storm seems to have passed now, at any rate.' "'I think so, too,' said Bathsheba. "'Though there are multitudes of gleams. Look!' The sky was now filled with an incessant light, frequent repetition melting into complete continuity, as an unbroken sound results from the successive strokes of a gong. "'Nothing serious,' said he. I cannot understand no rain falling. But heaven be praised, it's all the better for us. 
I'm now going up again. Gabriel, you are kinder than I deserve. I will stay and help you yet. Oh, why are not some of the others here? They would have been here, if they could, said Oak in a hesitating way. Oh, I know it all, all, she said, adding slowly, they are all asleep in the barn, in a drunken sleep, and my husband among them. That's it, is it not? Don't think I am a timid woman, and can't endure things. I am not certain, said Gabriel. I will go and see. He crossed to the barn, leaving her there alone. He looked through the chinks of the door. All was in total darkness, as he had left it, and there still arose, as at the former time, the steady buzz of many snores. He felt a zephyr curling about his cheek, and turned. It was Bathsheba's breath. She had followed him, and was looking into the same chink. He endeavoured to put off the immediate and painful subject of their thoughts by remarking gently, "'If you'll come back again, miss, uh, ma'am, and hand up a few more, it would save much time.' Then Oak went back again, ascended to the top, stepped off the ladder for greater expedition, and went on thatching. She followed, but without a sheaf. "'Gabriel,' she said in a strange and impressive voice. Oak looked up at her. She had not spoken since he left the barn. The soft and continual shimmer of the dying lightning showed a marble face high against the black sky of the opposite quarter. Bathsheba was sitting almost on the apex of the stack, her feet gathered up beneath her, and resting on the top round of the ladder. "'Yes, mistress,' he said. "'I suppose you thought that when I galloped away to Bath that night it was on purpose to be married?' "'I did at last. Not at first, he answered, somewhat surprised at the abruptness with which this new subject was broached. "'And others thought so, too?' "'Yes. And you blamed me for it?' "'Well, a little.' "'I thought so. Now, I care a little for your good opinion, and I want to explain something. I have longed to do it ever since I returned, and you looked so gravely at me. For if I were to die, and I may die soon, it would be dreadful that you should always think mistakenly of me. Now listen." Gabriel ceased his rustling. I went to Bath that night, in the full intention of breaking off my engagement to Mr. Troy. It was owing to circumstances which occurred after I got there that, uh, that we were married. Now do you see the matter in a new light? I do. Somewhat. I must, I suppose, say more, now that I have begun. And perhaps it's no harm, for you are certainly under no delusion that I ever loved you, or that I can have any object in speaking, more than that object I have mentioned. Well, I was alone in a strange city, and the horse was lame, and at last I didn't know what to do. I saw, when it was too late, that scandal might seize hold of me for meeting him alone in that way. But I was coming away, when he suddenly said, he had that day seen a woman more beautiful than I, and that his constancy could not be counted on unless I at once became his, and I was grieved and troubled. She cleared her voice, and waited a moment, as if to gather breath, and then, between jealousy and distraction, I married him. She whispered with desperate impetuosity. Gabriel made no reply. He was not to blame, for it was perfectly true about, uh, about his seeing somebody else she quickly added, and now I don't wish for a single remark from you upon the subject. Indeed, I forbid it. I only wanted you to know that misunderstood bit of my history, before a time comes when you could never know it. You want some more sheaves? She went down the ladder, and the work proceeded. Gabriel soon perceived a languor in the movements of his mistress up and down, and he said to her, gently as a mother, I think you had better go indoors now. You are tired. I can finish the rest alone. If the wind does not change, the rain is likely to keep off." "'If I am useless, I will go,' said Bathsheba, in a flagging cadence. "'But, oh, if your life should be lost!' "'You are not useless, but I would rather not tire you any longer. You have done well.' "'And you better,' she said gratefully. "'Thank you for your devotion. A thousand times, Gabriel. Good night.' I know you are doing your very best for me." 
She diminished in the gloom and vanished, and he heard the latch of the gate fall as she passed through. He worked in a reverie now, musing upon her story, and upon the contradictoriness of that feminine heart which had caused her to speak more warmly to him to-night than she had ever done whilst unmarried and free to speak as warmly as she chose. He was disturbed in his meditation by a grating noise from the coach-house. It was the vane on the roof turning round, and this change in the wind was the signal for a disastrous rain. End of chapter 37